Hello, everybody. I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Get Real with Rick Dancer. All right, we're going to start right off the bat. We got a couple of weeks till the election, and I I've already voted. I've I've I don't usually do it that early. Of course, I come from Oregon, and in Oregon we had vote by mail, which I don't approve of that much. Um, I think it's screwy, but it's what it is. Uh, but I'm here in Montana, so now I can go to a polling place. But now the only way to fight the battle that we're fighting is that. People who are Green Party, uh, Family Party, Independent Party, non-affiliated voters, Republicans, you all need to get out there and vote early because those numbers coming in, it really does make a difference. As of today, I think Florida has 100,000 Republicans have voted in early voting in Florida, and it just started. So it's super important you get out there and do it. If you don't vote, don't bitch. That's my motto. You have nothing to complain about if you're not going to participate in the process. I have no t patience or tolerance with people who complain and say, why is this person in charge? Why is this happening when they sat on their dead ass and did absolutely nothing to vote? No, t no tolerance whatsoever. I'm intolerant to that sort of thing. So anyway, we've got a great show tonight. Um, uh, the Bearded Social Worker is back. Uh, this guy's from uh, far, far eastern Oregon, and Brandon is a great guy. He's a, a counselor. Um, he can explain more about that. But he's been getting a lot of people in talking about their marriage. And so Brandon's going to share with us the five steps to helping to save your marriage. But first, let's get our sponsors in here. Um, Chris Dental. <laughs> Michael Ratlin. And by the way, just so you know, he is looking for two dentists right now who would like to start a new life in rural Oregon. He has two clinics that are open and two positions for dentists. So if you're interested, call that number, ask for Dr. Bratlin and tell him you saw it right on here. If you are looking for work to change your life and do something a little different, Albert Taylor works with people with different abilities in Eugene Springfield, always looking for folks to come in and uh, kind of, I'll tell you what, you go home at the end of the day and you're gonna feel like you really did do something. Our other sponsor, New American Funding, Greg Hinkle and the lending team, uh, mortgage uh, lender, and uh, he's really smart, not just because he's a friend of mine, but he's really super smart and knows how to get you into programs that uh, maybe you didn't know even existed. Uh, he's, he's really connected with that and he knows when it's a good time to buy and how to do that. So Greg Hinkle is the best. Also, Montana Oral Surgeons. Uh, great people. They're located in Bo uh, Boeing, <laughs> Bozeman. Good God, Rick, come on. Great Falls, Helena, and Butte, Montana. And I'll tell you what, what I love about them is they put you out. <laughs> if I'm going to have oral surgery, I want to be knocked out two sheets to the wind. I don't want, when I wake up, I want to say who did what, and I don't care where you put it. That's my kind of place. And you leave hyperbarics and wellness center, Matt McCarl, great guy. If you're looking for hyperbarics, tell him it's, you saw it on Rick Dancer and he'll give you a discount the first time. Um, hyperbarics is awesome for all kinds of things. Look it up. It's really great. He also does light therapy. Um, they're doing all, I mean, Matt, if there's something new, Matt is really into it. Sometimes we have trouble promoting him on YouTube because YouTube is so snarly that, you know, if it's not, you know, cough, get a tetanus shot, get the vax, if all that, if it's anything out of the ordinary, YouTube doesn't like it and they censor it. So we have to find ways to sneak around their little rules. And we do, I'm proud to say. And the bearded social worker appears. <laughs> hey, Rick. How's that for an opening? Guilt people opening. Into voting. And well, I get so tired of that. In all the years I was in news, um, you know, you, people I get in conversations, they'd be complaining and saying, how come this didn't happen? And these people didn't do this. I go, did you go to the city council meeting? No. Did you vote for the city councilors? No. Did you vote for the mayor? No. Did you vote for the governor of Oregon? No. Well, then shut up because <laughs> yeah, you sure. didn't participate. And now you're sitting there, way, you know, whining about it. And, and, you know, when they give you the numbers, I think it's interesting when they give the numbers of, you know, like we had a 55% turnout. Well, that's 55% of the 100% of people who are eligible to vote. I, I mean, who, who are registered to vote. That doesn't yeah. count all the thousands and thousands of people that don't even bother to register. That's and there are many true. of them. And so it's, yeah. it's just shocking that people don't want to be more involved. And this year, I'm thinking it's going to be a little different, I hope. I hope so. It sounds like I know a lot of people that are voting this year that have historically not 
Don't yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to see it. So you notified me. You said, Rick, I'm getting a lot of couples in and, you know, with marriage issues and there's patterns that are going on. And I wonder if we could share some stuff. And I think there's a lot of men and women out there who, you know, you get I think when you get married for a long time, you just kind of get lazy about working on your relationship. Then you separate, you, you get farther apart and then it feels like the end of the world and you can never bring it back together. So what, what are you experiencing in the counseling room? So I have seen a lot of couples coming in and really been, I either get one or two types. They're, they're coming in and their marriage is pretty much already exploded. And this is like a Hail Mary to try to save their marriage. Or they're recognizing like, hey, things are off and we need to try to figure out how to get this back on track and salvage what's there. Either way, the things that I'll talk about today are useful, no matter how far along your marriage is down the track of just imploding. Um, there's ways to turn around marriages. I'm pretty convinced that most relationships can be salvaged if okay. both parties want to make it work and want to put in the work. Um, but it's we've seen a lot more couples struggling really post COVID. And I think that you know, had, we, we've talked about this before. We don't know the long term impacts that COVID has had socially on people and relationally on people. And we're starting to see some of those longer term impacts. Um, in marriages, I, I feel it, I feel it right with myself. Even like you know, I'm I mean I'm just being honest, and people can you know say what they want to say, but until somebody takes responsibility, I'm angry. You know what yeah. I mean? I find myself angry because it's like, wait a minute, you disrupted lives and people and kids and schools and my bank account and my business and my neighbor's business and you impacted this and now what i i have people actually say to me well we just need to get over it and move on no 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 no. if you don't figure out what happened and why it happened it's going to happen again and i don't want that sure. to happen again you know what i mean and so it's frustrating Absolutely. so i can imagine in a marriage i mean fortunately <laughs> my wife and i are both angry <laughs> <laughs> that, so yes, have, common. that's good yeah, we have this where we can both go yeah this is ridiculous you know so we're not yeah. and we're not angry to the point where you know, we're throwing things but we both have the same desire like that this needs to be cleared up so it's not like one of us but i know lots of families couples where one person feels a little more this way and a little bit more that way and we're on the same page so we're not arguing about that but i can yeah. imagine what that would do to people so what's the first thing that you you see and recommend so i'm gonna i'll hit the five real quick and then we'll dig into them so okay. the first one is mastering the love languages and we'll talk about that a lot of people are aware of the five love languages but i want to dig a little deeper into that the second one is unmet uncommuted expectations we're gonna okay. dig into that a little bit creating a vision mission value statement for your family Okay. And that's normally to businesses, but it has a huge impact in families. Talking about the general need for love and security and respect in her marriage. And then the last thing is talk. the one thing I hear a lot of people say, oh, we've grown apart over the years. And kind of digging into, well, how do we get around growing apart as we grow throughout the years? One thing I've noticed real commonly is either marriages have two points in which they start to crumble. The first is around five to seven years statistically. Yeah. And a lot of it's because it's easy. Oftentimes when you first get married, it's just running on emotions and just the positive love feelings. And after like five years, the things that you kind of put up with start annoying you. They start digging at you um, and they'll start to become more prominent. We see a lot of big marriage disruptions around five to seven years. And then again, after the youngest kid graduates high school, and moves out and they have the empty nest. And that's when they're like, oh, well, we've just kind of grown apart. We don't really know each other anymore. And you see a lot of divorces and separations at that point. And so, see, I remember having trouble at seven years with Kathy mm -hmm. and me. That's when we went into both went into counseling, not together. <clears throat> we actually, the, the problem wasn't as much our relationship as it was each other, each of us. Yeah. So yeah. I had to go figure out what the hell I was doing and she had to go figure out the same thing. And then we brought it back together and we never did actually did marriage counseling. It was really, we were so screwed up ourselves. <laughs> Once we got each, oh, I am a bumblehead. Okay. Yeah, you know? she's right. <laughs> <laughs> but she found out she had her things too. And then I oh, like what cool. you were saying. Our in, I, I, I track with what you're saying is, yeah, all the, you know, wild sex and craziness in the first five to seven years. And then all of a sudden you yeah. realize, okay, this is for life. And when you do that, it's really irritating. And I'm going to live with this for the rest of my life. You know, yeah, and I we think put up a lot of things for yeah. both. Yeah. 
And so what do you do with that? What do you is there's a lot of pursuit in the beginning of a relationship to, or to get them. Like, you know, I'm trying to get the girl and they're trying to get the guy. And like, we put a lot of energy into it, but then we get married and it's like, cool. Now I can slack off. I got the prize and now we pull back and right. we just kind of ride on what we've done and nothing is static. Like everything is either moving, growing, or it's pulling back. We don't just get to sit and arrive in a relationship. It's constant work or it deteriorates. And so we just kind of soar on that for a little ways, but it slowly starts deteriorating in it. About five, seven years is when that starts to manifest. How does it show up? How does it manifest itself oftentimes with people? Your people get very irritated with the littlest. Like when couples come in and they're just like nitpicking, like the little things, like how they chew their food, how they sleep at night. Like that's when, you know, like they are at the end of that, like the high of marriage. And they're just like, they have no tolerance for one another anymore. And, you know, they start rolling their eyes at each other, which really is a sign of disgust. And right. if I'm disgusted with something, I throw it away. I don't want it in my life. And so you start seeing that. Um, but it's kind of a slow deterioration of patience and tolerance of one another. And we start just holding each other accountable for just like the smallest little things. And we don't have much grace towards one another when we do that. So what do you do when that's the situation as a counselor? So I like to start off with... <clears throat> couple basic things. There's some things that often happen over time that gets to that point. And a big part of it is, is people are feeling unloved and just kind of like the other person has stopped pursuing them. And so I, right off the bat, I have couples do a couple different assessments. And one of them is Gary Chapman. He wrote a book, The Five Love Languages. Yeah, I And I have people, there's like a free online test you can do, and it'll tell you which of the five you are and how you rank. And, and really, it doesn't matter which one you are. Like it's irrelevant, really what one you are. What's most important is that your spouse knows which one you are. And so and you know which one your spouse is and you know which one they are. So the five are physical touch, words of affirmation, quality time, gifts and acts of service are the five different categories that it will place you in. And like you said, what's important is to know what my spouse's love language is, because what we will do naturally is I will show love how I feel love. So if I feel loved by acts of service, I will show other people I love them by doing acts of service for them. Now to them, yeah, they might value that, but it's like, that doesn't make them feel love because their love is words of affirmation. And so it's it's slightly different dialect, I guess, in language where they kind of see it as, as he obviously cares about me because he's doing some work for me, but they don't register that as love. That's a huge so, problem too, because <clears throat> don't you think, uh, well, like, you know, personally, and my thing, uh, mine is touch. And mm -hmm. my wife is not a touchy person. So God, I think yeah. God sometimes puts you with someone to to make you work those things out in your life. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. And so I'm a touch person. And so then I go to touch her and she's like, I mean, and she's not, you know, untouchable, but it's like, you know, if somebody, if, if she came up and just touched the back of my neck or something, mm -hmm. what do you need? I'll do anything yeah. in the world you want. You I know, mean, that, I tell that, my guys, my guys are like dogs, you know, and if you like scratch our bellies or we'll wag our tails and we'll do anything you want, you know, it's just, we take very little. <laughs> right. and, then, and then hers yeah. is like time, which is like, yeah. no, not time. That's the thing I have the least of. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, and it's that quality time stuff. So we've had to learn over the years after we read that book, mm -hmm. how to, and now that you're reminding me, I'm going, yeah, I can, I, I need a refresher course in that because it's, it's just taking the time. And it's not like going in and say, okay, 30 minutes, I've got 30 minutes for you. Ready you know, go. That'll, that'll get you far. <laughs> so a big part that's important. So I like to take these categories and then I ask each of my clients to dig further. So like physical touch. Like it doesn't have to be sex. It can literally no. be like just holding my hand, yeah. rubbing my neck. Like it doesn't have to be sex in order to meet that need. Um, or quality time's a big one. Cause a lot of guys are like, well, I spend quality time. My wife, I take her hunting with me. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that is time together. She may not be seeing, maybe she does. A lot of women do like hunting, but like right. she may not see that as quality time and not feeling love. Like maybe her idea of quality time is going to a musical, for example, or something. And so it's good to find out from our spouses, like, okay, quality time is your love language. Be, but more specifically, how would that look on an ideal, like how are you most likely going to feel love through quality time together? Like, is it going for a walk, holding hands? Is it sitting and watching a movie together? Like as much as we can tell our spouses about our love language, the better, because everybody, 
I don't wake up in the morning not like not wanting to love my wife. I do the best I can. So right. we're expending energy to show other people we love them. But if we're using the wrong love language, it's not being received. And if I can tweak the energy just a little bit on how I'm expending it, they're going to receive it much fuller and they're going to feel more loved. And when we feel loved, we will show love back to that person at higher levels. Well, what's and so crazy, <clears throat> what's so crazy about it too, Brandon, is if, so if mine were service mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and I love what your point is, but I think that it's worth making again. So people, especially men hear this is so if mine service, I like to be served or I like mm -hmm. to serve somebody. Yeah. So that, but, but if my wife's isn't to being served, if it's quality time, I'm wasting my time. <clears throat> it doesn't mean you don't serve them, but it means I, yeah. I'm, I'm doing to them what I think they should do back to me. And if I say I'm serving you because this is what I would want, this is how I would do it. So then there's a conversation. Well, she says, well, mine's quality time. So I, I love that you made dinner tonight, but if we spent time together for an hour cooking together, doing that, that would be, that's a way you can serve me, but also fulfill it. And we go out and do <clears throat> what, well, that works for me. Well, but it's not her love language. Yep. And I think a lot of guys, especially guys are like that, but I think women are too. It's like, you know, I'm going to cook a meal for you and stuff like that. Well, if you just touched me, you know, when I walked in the door or gave me a hug or something, I'm good for the night. I don't need sex. Yeah. I can just, I mean, I'll take it, but I'm just looking for a, a touch, you know, yeah. and, yeah. and the dinner's great. And I appreciate that, but that doesn't fill the void for me. Yeah. So I think the more we can clarify with our spouses, like, you know, do these exams, which is a really easy assessment to tell you where you're at, but then recognizing that how can I best explain this, how I feel loved in a way that they're going to best be able to do it. Because if, if, if my wife can tell me, Hey, like it's quality time and here's specific examples of when in the past you've done things that really have hit it on the head. It's like, awesome. I want to know so I can do that again. Right. Because I'm going to I'm going to expend the energy either way. I'd like to know how to fine tune it so that she best receives that love. So, Brandon, can you I don't remember from the book. I can't. It's been a long time. Can you be like with a lot of psychological things, you know, when they do those tests where you're a, a Labrador or, you know, a, a retriever or whatever? Can you be a high high in service? A secondary one might be touch mm -hmm. something like that. So you'd yeah, have so to rank them. And it's not like if acts of service is the last one that it's not important because sometimes they're all like just barely different, you know, and you may be kind of like any of them. Like some people are really close. Some have very dramatic um, differences, but all of them are necessary in relationship. And most people value all of them. It's not that they don't. It's just, I want to become the master. We, we want to become the masters of our spouse's love language. Right. And that's for many reasons. One, they're going to feel incredibly loved by us. And so they're more likely to reflect that love back in love languages that we appreciate. Also, it kind of a fair proofs the marriage, because if I'm not meeting a primary need, somebody may purposely or, or just inadvertently meet that need of my spouse and might draw them away. And that right. happens a lot where <laughs> if somebody's feeling really low on their how they feel loved and a coworker, for example, comes along and just starts happen to meeting that need. That's not good. But if I am mastering them and I'm fulfilling that love language all over the place, then it doesn't matter what anyone else does or says. They're right. going to feel very loved and helping to full proof, full proof your marriage. Yeah, because <clears throat> because you know, just like there's good and evil in the world, and yep. <clears throat> if we have an enemy of our soul, if if husband isn't providing for the wife that need. And all of a sudden Joe coworker comes up and unknowingly just is that kind of, is a server too, or happens yeah. to fill that language. It's not, well, Brian just understands me so much. Well, you've been set up, you know, and if, yeah. if your husband had known and had practiced what you're talking about, um, you would foolproof that and she wouldn't yeah. be looking for that when that's kind of one of those things where it just hedges against weaknesses in a marriage <clears throat> if anything we can do to hedge against those things and help our spouses feel loved and cherished and valued is gonna make the marriage tenfold better and two when you're feeling loved you're less likely to be nitpicky of other people yeah like if i really if i'm really feeling loved by somebody i'm not gonna like be annoyed by how they chew or how they breathe or just their presence in the room but if i am not feeling loved and i'm feeling kind of neglected then a lot of things people do will annoy me. 
if it's somebody I don't really like or they don't feel like they like me, then they just annoy me. And so it kind of hedges against that because when they're feeling love, they, they're more tolerant of me and, and I'm more tolerant right. of them. And so it's good. Okay. Number two. Number two, unmet, uncommunicated expectations. Oh, so I this never, is never a have this problem. This is a, <laughs> we never have issues with communication. I've never had this problem at all, even so, today. One of the biggest things I hear a lot of people say is like, well, I expected her to do this and she's not doing it. Or she, or the wives will say, I, I, I expect him to do this and he's not doing it. And my question to them is, have you communicated it? And they're like, either they'll say, well, no, I just assume because he's the husband, he should do these things. Or I assume because she's my wife, she should do these things. Or they say, well, I've said something in the past, but just because you verbalize it doesn't mean that the person received it and heard it well. And so what happens is, is growing up, we have parental figures of some sort that we observed. Like, okay, my dad did these things in my life. My mom did these things in my life. So I associate those tasks to that side of the partnership. And so when I got married, I'm like, okay, my wife should be doing these tasks because that's what I've associated that the wives do. And my wife would have done the same thing, observing, okay, my dad does these things. So Brandon should be doing these things. And we don't communicate those expectations because we just think they're universal. Like, that's just what we've seen. That's what we assume. Right. And then all of a sudden things aren't happening and there's, and, but we don't communicate it. We just get resentful and we're frustrated and we're not telling the other person because we just think they know, and they're just not doing it out of spite or whatever. And it's like, and then they tell you and it's like, well, shoot, I can do that. That's easy. Like most things, once it's communicated, it's like, oh, I didn't know that was a problem. And I'm happy to make that adjustment. Um, but so many clients I work with, that is a huge piece I, where, yeah, that, I can even see that in my life, you know, where my wife, I have a wife who's, <clears throat> who loves to tinker with the lawnmower <laughs> and, and she just, you know, her dad was the guy who went out there and Kathy would be with him fixing stuff. And I am not Mr. Fix it. So we've had many issues over in the past yeah. over She's out fixing the lawnmower. I feel like I should be doing it, but I don't know how to do it. She's tinkering, you know, and so we've had to talk those things out. She goes, well, then what are the things you want to do? You know, and what are the things you you think are your expectations? So it's been, yeah. and, you know, it, it, all all people don't grow up with the stereotypes that are the same. You know what I mean? And it really doesn't even matter. It, what matters is, is that you two agree on the expectations. So one thing I have my clients do is they each write down what did they expect of their spouse? And, and then we get together, we do this usually in a session, just in case things erupt, you know, it's like, okay, yeah. Yeah. I'll have each of them read their expectation of the other person. And I asked the other one, I'm like, do those expectations seem reasonable? And 99% of the time they're like, yeah, that's absolutely reasonable. Like, and most people's expectations are very reasonable of each other. Right. Um, and so what's more important is, is communicating what expectations are. Cause then we can meet that. Like, it's like entering a business agreement and like a business partnership. And we have expectations in that business. And if we don't communicate that, like if you and I were to go into business together, but we didn't really, I just assumed you'd know what I'm doing and you'd assume that right. I'm on your page. Our, our business is going to erupt when I realize, well, Rick's not doing what I expected him to do. And you're like, you're not doing what you're supposed to do because we never communicated it. And so many marriages come together and they never, ever, ever talk about roles, what the expectations are. And especially now that both usually both spouses are working in our current right. day and age and like just for lots of reasons, home is a full time job. Right. Like taking care of the house is a full. So it's like, OK, who's doing that? And if we right. don't communicate, you come home, it, 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 it falls on a lot on the wife. When you have kids, yeah. it falls on the wife a lot, which isn't yeah. fair because then now who's loading the dishwasher? Who's cleaning up? Who's putting the kids to bed, brushing teeth, all that. If you don't have that worked out, somebody's going to get resentful because it's why do yeah. I always have to do this, 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 and this without laying it out? I like yeah. that a lot. And I'll tell my clients too, because they'll be upset. And I'm like, well, if you haven't communicated it, you don't have the right to be upset about it because they don't know. Right. You can't hold them accountable for what they don't know. Now, if you told them and they've acknowledged that, yep, I get it. I understand. And they continue to do it. Yeah. Now you can kind of hold them accountable because they're, they know that's an expectation, but um, until that it's, you really can't get too hard on them because they don't, they're not aware. They don't wake up with them. Most people, I, I use that most because some people probably do. Most people don't get up in the morning to upset their spouses. 
right. think there are occasions out there where some spouses do get up in the morning to upset their spouse. Like that's happens. Most don't. So if I am upsetting my spouse, it's not intentional. And so it's being made aware to those expectations like, hey, kind of expected you to do this yesterday. You didn't do it. That was a little frustrating. OK, cool. Didn't know that was expected of me. I'll make sure to hit that in the future. Like it's that easy. But it's if I don't know, then that's when a lot of that kind of uh, spitefulness starts happening and resentment starts happening because I'm not holding up my end of the deal that my spouse has for me because I don't know. Right. So it's really important to communicate what are our expectations of one another, no matter how long you've been married, even if, if it's Brett, if you're just in the marriage or a new relationship, or if you've been married for 50 years, there's probably going to be things you didn't know was expected of you that your spouse has just been tolerating. Right. And it's good to correct those things and kind of curve that a little bit. So what's number three? Oh, vision, mission, value statement. So this, I heard actually on another podcast, I don't remember what podcast, but they were talking about the, the value of these in businesses. Pretty much most successful businesses will have a vision, mission, and value statement. Like vision, what are we doing as a yeah, business? Mission, how are we going to do it? And values, by what set of characteristics or morals are we going to accomplish those goals? Marriages should have this as well and families. Because if you don't, everybody's going to be kind of doing their own thing. And they're going to be pulling against one another. Uh, when you think about it, so like how money is spent, how time is spent, commitment, energy, all of that stuff is kind of being divided and pulling against one another. Where if as a family, you say, like, what is our like, what do we want to be seen or what do we want to be focusing on as a family? What are the tasks we're going to do in order to do that? And then by what set of values are we going to do that? Then when you have like opportunities, there's all kinds of shiny things that present themselves like opportunities all the time, financial opportunities, um, time obligations, commitments, boards to be on. It's endless. My wife just, she's on a soccer board now. That's a huge time commitment, but it has a value towards what are we doing? Like we want to create a community that our kids can thrive in and they love soccer. So her being on the board helps drive towards that goal. So anytime we have a, a option, whether it's a financial, um, purchase or commitment or time commitment, anything, then we take that and compare that to our vision and mission statement. Does that align with where we're going as a family or does it not? Like, should we move forward forward with this opportunity or should we pass on it? It's a good opportunity, but it doesn't line us up with where we're trying to go as a family. And that's what keeps businesses successful as they stay on track with their vision and mission and in their lane. Ones that spread out going all different directions don't last. Um, but if, if somebody came to your wife and said, would you be on the, you know, farmer's market committee and stuff and your children aren't involved? But, well, you know, the, the soccer works because my kids play soccer. I can spend time with them. That fits into mm-hmm. our family mission statement. It also gets me involved in the community, which yeah. farming, the farmer's market would too. But, but then you have some value statements. You can go in and go, this is going to get more of the, with, with the kids, with this, doing this, doing this than the farmer's market. So you don't have to do everything because I think we don't have time things. to do everything. So we got to oh. be selective. And so it's like, let's do things. But if, but if as a family, we don't have a united vision of what are we doing, then we may be pulling in opposite directions that financially hurtful that. And then two, if I see a cool idea, I'm like, I want to do this and I want to spend money on this. It's not my wife telling me, no, it's our vision mission statement that we agreed upon saying no. Right. So if she wants to do something, it wouldn't be me telling her no. It's saying like, hey, how does that compare to our vision mission statement as a family? Does it align? If it does, do we have the budget for it? You know, because we can't just spend money, even though it all aligns, we can't go buy huge things all the time. So right. you got to follow along with a budget. But um, but that is a huge thing unifying families and especially well, like, and I see, where we're heading in life. I see this move with young couples too, which I'm not being critical of it. I don't understand it, but I, I'm not trying to be critical, but you know, two working people and they have separate budgets or they'll pay yeah. into here. You'll pay. We all pay half the electricity. You pay half the electricity. If you're not on the same page. Yeah. I mean, what, so what, partner a is out buying new boots and all this, and you're going to be going, well, then I'm going to buy new boots. I mean, yeah. that, you know what I mean? That makes it have a me, lot of, Couples that work with have separate budgets and they try to like, 
I don't know. To me, because of my faith background, it's like when you, you become married, you become one. And so yeah. in my mind, like your budget should be one. Everything you're That's doing should how be I, united front. But and I see that, that a lot. When you have this, a lot of times what happens in relationships is <clears> – <throat> If you're under stress, then it's you against the stress, and then it can turn you and your wife towards one another. Right. As a married couple, it's like it's just us. We're a united front against whatever comes against us. Right. We face this, even though maybe it's an attack on me or it's my own issues, we're going to join this together so we don't turn towards each other. But together, we're going to be united fighting against whatever happens. And when we set a vision mission statement, it really helps couples to be more united in the battles that you face in this life. So yeah, I remember when I got married, my, the pastor who, you know, counseled us or something said, your biggest issue is going to be, um, you know, arguments over finances. Now yes. that didn't turn out to be true. I'm sure that's true for a lot of couples yeah. <laughs> for ours. It was like your kids because yeah. we both raised kids. I was raised one way. She was raised on the East coast, another way. And while we didn't think our parents did the greatest job, it was still better than the other one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where you yeah. go, oh, we don't do that. So that was, but it was like you said, it was always conversation of talking it out and going, yes. here's my expectation of what they should do. And, yep. you know, that kind of thing. And, and I think especially for kids, if you're going to have kids like, hey, like, how are we going to discipline them? How are we, how are we going to exactly. school them? Are we going to homeschool them? Are we going to public school them? Like, because those are big differences of people's, how they're raised. And it you can know, cause yeah. huge conflicts. Also, you have kids together and it's like, Will they do realize the differences? What kind of chores are they going to do? Are you going to yep. make them do the chores? You know what I mean? That living up to that stuff. It's all like what you're talking about in the contract of when we have children and when the children come along and then you bring them into that contract too, is we yep. expect you guys to do empty the garbage. Somebody does the dishes. It's all yep. laid out so that nobody gets to go. I don't want to do that. Well, you know, we already agreed to this. It's in the yep. family mission statement. I really like yep. that. Because all these things line up into the mission statement because then it, it gives people the why. If I ask somebody to do something, they don't know the why, they're going to be resistant to it. But if I can show how, hey, our, we came up with this and this is how these chores and this is how these activities align with what we're doing, then people know why at least. And, and kids can understand at least. I like that. Best for the best. What's, their number, what's number four? I, I'm liking this. I'm going to. Number I'm gonna, four. I feel like um, I'm getting counseling here. <laughs> so this is, I talk a lot in generality. So none of these are 100% accurate, but. One thing that I think is important to recognize is generally women are seeking security and love in a relationship. That's how they feel loved is through security. Right. Generally, men feel loved in a relationship through respect. And I think that those are huge things to think about in a relationship that's crumbling a little bit because likely she is not feeling secure. And that's an important thing, you know, and again, it goes back to these conversations, but it's like, you know, in what ways does she feel secure and are you meeting those needs? You know, and for her to identify, she feels security through whatever means. And how is he doing meeting those needs? Is, is he creating an environment where she feels secure, where she feels like she can communicate and be heard? Does she feel like she's uh, safe? Does she feel like he's a protector? Like, like all these things, like security is huge. Where men, it's not so much security. It's not even so much love necessarily. They feel love through feeling respected. And that's a big man. Like respect is huge among men. Right. And so for women, it's important. There's a book that was written. Uh, it's called Love and Respect. And it's a good book if you go into it with the right headspace. I've had some clients go into it where all they got out of at the end of the book was she doesn't respect me. I'm like, okay, did you read any of it about, are you loving her? And, you know, and he's like, well, she doesn't respect me. So I don't want to love her. I have a hard time showing her love when she doesn't show me respect. And I talked to her and she's like, well, I don't want to respect him because he doesn't love me. And I'm like, okay, valid. But from, again, from my uh, faith background, you know, in scripture, there's a verse about this that says, husbands, love your wives, wives, yeah. respect your husbands. Yeah. And one thing I thought that's important about that, that valuable statement is it doesn't say husbands, love your wife if she respects right. you. And right. wives, respect your husband only if he loves you. Because, and I, and I put this on the husbands, I'm really hard on the husbands when I work with couples, because I think they're, they're responsible for the condition of their marriages. Right. I and too. so, 
I put it on them like, hey, you need to break that cycle. I don't care if she doesn't respect you. You will show you got to show her love. Prove to her she, you're somebody worthy of respecting, not just because of you're the husband, but like because you're a man of character who deserves to be respected. If you're yelling at her all the time and treating her bad and threatening her and like, I don't blame her for not respecting you. So you got to treat her with kindness and love and security and she won't be able to help but respect you. And follow Brandon, this also, this also goes back to number three. If you had a mission statement that said, mm -hmm. here's the things you're supposed to do that we want as a family. So here's the way we get there is I'm doing these things. You're doing these things, not hard and fast. Sometimes I'm yeah. going to have to do dinner and when the kids need, you know, but if you do that, it wouldn't that be more and much more easy to respect and to love because you've laid out a plan. Yes. I, I think most marriages, people are just like, well, you respect me because I'm your husband and you love me yeah. because I'm your wife. And it's like, no, we, we love and respect each other because we have a plan. We have yep. a, a we, expectations are known. And so the one thing that, that we're doing out. kind of along that line is uh, in our family, we're building a vision, mission, value statement. And one of the things we're doing is my son and I are taught, he's only six, but it's never too early to start instilling. Oh, in, I think that's in, great. In young people. But we're talking about what does it mean? to be the husband in the family, to be a godly man. Like, what does that mean? Like, what are the characteristics that that brings to the table? And my wife and my daughter are doing the same thing with what does it mean to be like a, a good wife and a, and a godly wife? And what does that mean? Like, what are those strengths? What are those things that contribute? Um, because it starts to instill, like it's, it's doesn't matter what the feedback I'm getting. I still am responsible for being a person that loves a person that, and, and you know, I think that was in scripture because men struggle to show love. It's not easy. And I think that's why I was like, dude, you got to love your wives. That's not easy. Right. And women who it's not easy to respect and put yourself under that submission of other people. That's not easy. Right. So it's like recognizing both of these are tasks that are difficult and really require the other one to participate for that to work well. Mm -hmm. But when that happens, when the wives are feeling loved and secured and the husbands are feeling respected and whatever, and again, that has to be a discussion with each other. Like, what does respect mean? Like, how do I know my wife is respecting me? Like, what does that look and like? How, how can yeah, she what does respect you, you? It's then again, that's where language could be so messy yeah. because my idea of respect would be this. Well, mm -hmm. she doesn't know what that is. She doesn't gotta, know what my it. definition of respect yeah. is. And I'm looking at her and going, you're not respecting me because I have never told her. For me, how I feel respected is when you blah. Yeah. So if we can know? give examples and same thing with our wives, like how do they feel loved and how do right. they feel security? And so that we can know like that's how we need to be focusing so they really feel that. And so that when those are vacant, relationships struggle a lot. And so it's really helpful to identify those things and work on developing to hedge against those weaknesses. So Gosh, that's so what's, num what's number five? And then the last one that I hear a lot I well. this is where couples that have been married for a longer time and maybe their kids have moved out, but it's the talking of we we've, we've grown we just grown apart, and and mm, I hear that a lot from couples. I'm like, well, what does that even mean? And I think what happens is, you know, so my wife I use her a lot as an example. She's a wonderful woman, um, and she is a marathon runner, and she loves running marathon. She's ran like a ultra marathon at one point in a triathlons. And I, I struggled to run like a 5k. Like that's a big deal for me. <laughs> like, I am not a runner. She is. But what happens a lot is when our spouses have interests that we're not really interested in, is we don't show a lot of interest. Okay. Have fun on your run. Like I'm going to go do my thing. And we don't show any interest in them. And so we do grow apart. Now for me, I'm like, I can't run, but Hey, I can be a good water boy. So at all the checkpoints, I'm there like switching out water, make sure she's got snacks, supporting her. And when she, the time commitment, it takes to train, right. you know, like giving her that space so she can go do that. And like the kids supporting her and making signs, like we can still remain close and I can grow with her in her hobby by being a support role for her. And right. same thing with my hobbies. She's not into hunting. She's really not into like fixing up old vehicles and, we're getting some cows on our property. She's not a big fan of the cows necessarily, but like, but she is continuing to show interest in my hobbies by participating, by, you know, having conversations about them, by showing interest. So we don't have to 
like what our partners are doing as far as a hobby, but we still have a lot of room to connect so that we don't grow apart. Cause people will say like, I don't even know my spouse anymore. You know, my, my hobbies have brought me this way and there's hobbies that brought them that way. And, you know, it's like, well, because you allowed it. Yeah. You allowed, you know, there's a really awesome uh, quote. Somebody who told me, you know, but there's a whole story about this guy's great aunt and they were married for incredible amount of years, but his big takeaway from her was always be a student of your spouse. Never stop learning. Never stop. Um, asking questions like how can how can I better be loving you? How can I better be showing you respect? Or how can I better be meeting your love languages? Um, because those change. Love languages can change over the years, and so it's good to continually ask. And like every once in a while, I ask my wife feedback. I'm like, hey, how how am I doing? Like, is there anything I'm missing right now? Because like she's not one. A lot of people aren't going to be the ones that say, hey, you're not doing a good job loving me, or you're missing these right. things until you get into an argument. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, if you preventatively bring it up and give them the space to have that conversation, it's like, hey, I'm really interested. How am I doing? Are you feeling loved by me? Is there areas I could be doing better? She's going to have the feeling of like, yeah, actually, these things could be maybe changed a little bit. And so it's constantly tweaking that process so that as we do grow, because we do grow, we do change, we do um, morph in different ways. We got to be students of each other. It's when we think we've arrived and we back off that we start to crumble. And so it's either you crumble or you continue to be a student, continue to grow and continue to learn how to love your spouse more fully. Well, see, because I think like with Kathy and me, when we were 50, mm -hmm. I don't even remember what it was. I just remember that all of a sudden we both went, hey, look, we should do it because we always had worked out at the gym, not together because we we fight because we both think we know what the other person should be doing. <laughs> so we're smart enough to know, okay, we go there, but we separate and go do our thing. And then we get yeah. back together, but it made it, you know, so it's 50. We said, let's go do a triathlon. So we both started training. We knew nothing That's about it. it. We hadn't swam. We went and swam. We started running. Um, she was a cyclist. So that's what got that, you know, kind of going. Okay. I didn't really like, you know, the, the road biking, but I did it with her because it was something we could do together. It wasn't, yeah. I didn't dislike it. It's just not my thing. And then, you know, then from that we started, you know, now we do these, we came to Montana. Well, they don't have roads like we have in Oregon. I mean, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's dirt and gravel. So I said, okay, now we're going to start mountain biking. Well, I love mountain biking. So she misses her road cycling, but she mountain bikes with me and we yeah. go on places. So we it's just kind of like, I think God's just kind of covered us and we found these things we do together. People are like, oh my God, you do everything together. Well, we do because we yeah. like each other. We have fun together. And so that's been, that was point. 50 when we started doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because when, they, when you're young, when you're younger, you know, these people go, oh, I wish I could do that. Well, you have kids. We didn't do that when we had kids. You don't have time to go, you, you know, like you said, you, you your wife can go do the running and you can find ways to help her and support her and do your thing. But you yep. you can't go on and on. You can't become your life until wait, you wait till those kids leave your house. Then she's going to yeah. be like a killer. <laughs> she'll, she'll be like running in Australia or something. You know? Oh, no. She's, yes. Yeah. No, yeah. those people are, ultra marathon people are just, I mean, no offense to your wife, but they're nuts. I mean, they're oh, crazy they're, people. It's, she did a, thir it was, I can't remember, 30 some mile run. And she got done and she's like, oh, I, I didn't know we were already at the end. I have so much more energy until like, it's been. Like, yeah, shut up. She smiles the whole time. Like, yeah. the, like she run by, she's got a grin on her face. She, it's it's incredible. Well, but I think what you're saying is true is find things that keep you together. And it, when you're when you have kids, you know, it's going to be different kinds of things. But as you get into the place where I, I mean, I've been married 41 years and that's we awesome. at 50 age 50, that's when we started doing all this crazy stuff. And now we're just nuts about, it. you know, I mean, we do hikes and runs and, you know, people just go, what are you doing? And it's like, we're enjoying our company and people go, yeah, but don't you ever sit down? It's like, this is what we like to do, you know, and then yeah. we'll go to a, we love movies. So we go to a movie almost every Saturday night and we found the things that make us come alive. You know, I think yeah. you have to, marriage is, you know, so hard because you have to consistently work at it. And, and, and I think when you live with somebody, you take them for granted sometimes. And then you yeah. like your, this show is reminding me there's some things in my own life. I need to be, I haven't been asking these questions and 
and I need to go back. And it's, you know, I, I would like this to go on for, you know, well, 41 years. I'd like, you know, to make it to, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I used to say, you know, if I'm in adult diapers, I don't want to be alive anymore. But I've, changed my mind. <laughs> I've decided, you know, if I could get some like, you know, you know like a G string kind of under, you know, <laughs> adult diaper, where it doesn't well, have to, you know, ones. yeah. So I don't, have, yeah. So I don't have to look like I'm squishy, you know. I mean, maybe I could do that, you know. Maybe I'm okay. And then I look <laughs> at the guy next to me at the gym, and he's 84 years old, and he's yeah. coming in every day and smiling and going, giving me crap, and he's, you know, 84 doing his workout, and I'm going, you know what? This is a lifestyle, and it is. And yeah. um, well, so when you boil all this down, the five things that you've talked about, unfortunately for people, <laughs> it's all communication. It is and, or lack thereof. And that's probably the biggest thing you see in in, in um, marriages that go wrong is yeah. when they stop talking or telling, you know, I know sex is a big issue for people. And it's when you stop talking about what you want in your sexual yeah. relationship, both of you. And I think that's a yeah, huge yeah, issue. Communication, for whether it's around like sex, um, around just anything, you know, our our spouses should be who we were the most comfortable with, but unfortunately they get the leftovers of us after our days yeah. We work all day. Like everybody else gets the best of us. Strangers get the best of us. Yeah. We come home to our spouse and they get the leftover junk and it's unfortunate and we're tired. We don't want to communicate. And so our families, and so really it's like, how do we prioritize our lives where yeah. there's a guy named Jim Ramos. Love him. He's a Christian book writer, but um, he has a bumper sticker. It says God, then it has the greater sign than wife which is greater than kids, which is greater than work. Yeah. And I love that. And I have some clients I work with that are like, well, I'm not religious. I'm like, okay, cool. Just remove the God part. Your wife is greater than your kids. Yep. And I think when couples acknowledge that and they focus on their date nights, like having a date night once a week, even if it's just like <laughs> sitting down together in a just separate part of the house, holding hands, reading a book, just some sort of purposeful time together. But because at the end of the day, your kids are going to move out and you're still stuck with your wife. Like, you know, she Brandon, has to be authority is, over the kids. That is the hugest truth, even though hugest isn't a word, but that's all, the, all accepted. That's a huge truth because I remember when my kids were little. Um, I used to tell, we had a babysitter one time tell us so twice a year, Kathy and I'd leave for, for three nights. And it was like, because the first night, oh, baby, I remember <laughs> this. <laughs> the second <laughs> night was, I still remember this. The third night is, I'm ready to go home and see my family. Yeah. But I used to tell the, the babysitter one time told us, the, the boys told us that, that, your mom, that you and Kathy have to leave or you won't have a family anymore. <laughs> and I, said, well, that, I said, that's true. I said, yeah. If we aren't together then we yep. don't have a family anymore. And so it's, and I used to tell them when they were little and people would kind of shun me for that. But I used to say, your mom is the most important person in my life because when you're gone, you're going to leave my house yeah. and, and you're not going to come checking on me every day. And you're not going to you know, wonder what dad's doing. You're going to be starting your own life, but this is my partner forever. And I'll tell you what, as a guy who's married for 41 years, that is 100% true. And yep. we have planned out things that we're doing. And, you know, we know we have, things set apart. We are doing this on this night and we are doing yeah. these things. It's not as, you know, crazy as it was when we were younger, but it's all really good. And, and, and my kids, I think they see that. Yeah. And, and that's today. one of the biggest rules too, as parents is setting that example. So like my kids know, cause I've told them like, mom is more important than you guys. You guys are a close second, but mom's more important. And what that's teaching my kids is that someday when they get married, that they are to prioritize their spouses yep. over their kids, over me, like that needs to become their number one relationship. And, and, um, and when I think a lot of people feel like, you know, like they're, they have to, you know, that, that your kids, I think, and, and I, I guess, I guess I probably shouldn't, I think women are especially susceptible to that because you're a yeah. mom and you have a different sure. relationship with your child. Mm -hmm. And, and when Kathy and I've had our struggles with that too, is going, okay, so wh where do I fit into this whole thing with the boys and us and all that? But we've always talked about it. And for us, once they left the house, um, because we started in, you know, doing what we were doing, and I would highly recommend that find a hobby for people that you can do together, even if it's not your very favorite thing, but something like that, because, yeah. you know, then it just builds this, when we go places, we take our bikes. It's like, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to ride our bikes. We're going to find a place to ride our bikes. So the whole weekend in White City, 
you know, revolves around where's the best bike trail and where are we going to yeah. find this? And then where's the brewery? We're going to go have a beer afterwards and, yeah. and all that. And it becomes this whole thing where, you know, our friends go, yeah, no, we, we know. And then when I got hurt on my bike, you know, they're going, well, we figured something would happen, you know, <laughs> but, but that's kind of how you build that fun part of your relationship. And, yes. um, and you talk to I any couple that is like super happy. That's they prioritize the time together, the date nights and yeah. building hobbies that they both can enjoy. I mean, they can still have their own independence stuff, but they find hobbies that they both love doing together. Um, and it just builds deep relationship doing that. And yeah. And, and just talking, I think you're, you're so right when you were saying how it's so weird because it's the person we're around all the time and we care the most about and we stop talking about stuff, you know, and yeah. I'm, I'm fortunate because my wife is like very much if stuff's going wrong, she lets it go for a little bit, but then it'll come up like this. And so we have these long discussions about <laughs> you know, all the things that are difficult with, you yeah. know, okay. What is sex? What's that going to look like? What is dinner time? What's that going to look like? What's our weekend? How are we going to relate to the boys when they have this? You know, the next conversation when we get grandkids is how do we bring those into the con into what we're doing? And what's really fun for us, I love this about us, is, you know, when the boys come over or things happen and then we're done and they go home and we look at each other and we go, I love our kids. But you know what? I love this. Yeah. You know, this just you and me fire in the fireplace playing you know cards at the hearts or something we go down yeah. to a little pub and have play hearts and we're sitting in there and just doing our thing but it's like it's we still have a very important relationship and our kids even when we went on this trip to europe we had really strict things saying mom and i are going to do certain things that you're not going to want to do and we're going to do them Good. and everybody yeah. has to understand that so I love that you, but that must be, you have to have fun with your job because I know it's hard because you get people and, you know, but, but, but to be able to light the spark yeah. and somebody to go, you know what, if you're having issues with this, talk about it. And all of a I sudden say, changing someone's world, you know what I mean? I would say couples who are willing to do these things and actually uh, take it seriously and do them will turn their marriages around, whether they're having like big issues or not, they'll come like, after not that many sessions, it's amazing when you start honing in on your spouse's love language, it's like immediate benefit. Like immediately they're just like, holy crap, this is amazing. I feel awesome. Like, and it doesn't matter how, even if you think your marriage is good, if you tweak these things, it's going to become even better. But What's even again, relationships, like people come in just this far away from a divorce and we can still change things around when we help people understand there's just little things that are off and it's usually not big things in most divorce situations. Like I've helped couples get through affairs together that have had affairs. We can work through that. People can work through that and rebuild relationship. Um, so what's the name of the book to give people the name of the book and the author again? Uh, so the book is five love languages by Gary Chapman. Okay. Um, and it's, you can get it on Amazon because we yeah, have easy copies. to find. And usually when you buy a book, especially if you get a new, you get a code to go online and do the assessment. And it gives you kind of a full explanation, I suppose. Of, of the, But it's not necessary. You don't need it. All What's important just to know is what category does your spouse fall in and how specifically do they feel loved within that category? And like, what are some good examples and to kind of lead you? And the good news in all of this is no matter how long you've been married, you will be working on this for the rest of your life. You will. Which is fun because, yes, yes it's daunting at times, but it is fun because it means you're growing. Um, and and uh, and that's what relationships are all about. And the, the second thing is, you know what I always think with people and myself included is like, you know, when, when people get on that verge of divorce or are just giving up on the relationship, it's like I think – do you want to really go back and do all that again yeah, <laughs> with, right. another, with another person? It's like, oh, you know, I tell yeah. my wife, if I die, you, you really need to get remarried because she's only 60, you know, and it's like, you got a lot of life to live or something. And I, but both of us have said, oh my God, could you imagine all the work we've done and you have to go back and start all over again? So before you have an affair or before you give up on your marriage, think about, because I bet you find this too is, usually you're going to find the same problem with every woman that you marry or every man that you marry because the problems hit you. <laughs> yep. yep. It follows you. 
you know, when I got married, our pastor said, told me that he hoped that that day of all that love and joy of marriage just pales in comparison to the love that you understand in the future. And I'll say we've been married for 14 years and I thought I loved my wife then, but I, the amount I love her now is just more than I ever understood. But a lot of it's because we've been implementing these things and right. really honing in on each other. And it's, it's amazing what can change when you make just some small tweaks in a relationship. You, you know, it's good. It's, it's a good thing when you come home and you, if, if there's somebody else in your house or even my kid's dog or something, it, it's like, I walk in and I go, you're in the way of my relationship with my wife. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and even yeah. I love my kids, my boys, I love them to death. But even after a few days, it's kind of like, I'll go in the bedroom with her. I've shut the door. I say, okay, what, what we, this is getting old. <laughs> we need to just be you and me again. So yeah, we don't yeah. have the different dynamic that comes because we have a whole new dynamic. And I think that's the message I would give to those parents. Cause I remember how hard that was when your kids leave yeah. is hold on, just hang on because in a year or so, when you get used to that and you get that thing broken down, and then all of a sudden you're going to look over and go, Oh my gosh, we have our own life again. It's like, yeah. yes, we can enjoy our children, but we don't have to do, we don't have to raise them anymore. We don't have to do anything. This is about like, a, it's a whole new start. It's like, we get to have a fresh new marriage because we get to figure out what it's going to be. And that oh, if you just that. hang on so hard to that time, the hard, that hard year, you know, then all mm -hmm. of a sudden it just, it comes to this place where then you get selfish. And then when, what's really fun is you missed them so much and all that, that stuff. And that, then you put the point when they're in the way and you're kind of, cause your parents, Brandon probably feel like this. Sometimes when you come home, it's like, Oh, okay, I know they do. <laughs> they've been here a while. We need to get back to our book time. And when's our, our favorite TV right. show that we watch. Oh, you know, and, all yeah. that. <laughs> and that's good. We should be, you know, good. we should be those kind of things where you, when, when, you know, when my, my wife or whichever one of us passes away, I saw a headstone the other day at a cemetery. We were walking around because I love cemeteries and the husband and wife died on the same day. Hmm. And I thought, I I looked at my wife and she goes, I wonder what happened. And I said, you know what? The luckiest two people on the world because you went yeah. together. So yeah. it probably was grim, but they, you didn't, you, you know, I, I don't want to do this without my wife. And that's a nice place to be in your world is when. I, I love her so much that I I will do anything because I don't want to be the leftover. I don't want to be the guy that's left, you know? Exactly. So yeah. Think about the end of your relationship. Brandon, thank you so much. This is, yeah, you gave, on, right? you gave me things I have to work on again. And I like that. <laughs> 65 is like, I like finding things when I go, you know what? I got 10, 15, 20 more years. I could do this. I mean, I can make this successful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey how do people get a hold of you if they are just they just they need somebody just to talk because oh, so it's really easy that. they can reach out to me the bearded social worker at gmail.com or bearded social worker uh or yeah just bearded social worker.com will pull up my website um okay. if you just search the bearded social worker i'm the only one that comes up so um pretty easy to find okay brandon thank you so much for being here Thanks, Appreciate it. all right see you, you later too. all right bye-bye so yeah, seriously, if you guys are having trouble and um, that book is wonderful, my wife got it and we read it and we've done that over and over again. Um, but take some of the advice and if it's just stuff that you just, you're, you're too far apart, you think in your mind, um, give him a call. And even if he can't do that, maybe he can recommend somebody that's uh, closer to where you live or something like that. But um, in this day and age, online is just as good as being there. Um, so uh, good luck. Um, I'll tell you, you know what, when God puts two people together, he doesn't want them to separate. And, um, but it means we have to work. And you know what I always find? It's like, it's usually me that needs to do the work. And yeah, she, Kathy has her stuff too, but it's usually, I can't blame it on her. Um, and, and God loves me so much. He doesn't want me, uh, to be, he put her in my life to help make me who I'm supposed to be. So why would I want to not experience all of that? Well, thank you for watching. Share this on your page. Um, we'll talk to you later. Good night.